Thank you for joining us for the Medical Alley Association series, Leadership Through a Crisis. Joining us today is Ken Holman, President and CEO of CentraCare, to talk to us about the unique challenges he had to face leading a rural health network through COVID-19. Ken, thank you so much for joining us. Talk to me a little bit about when the gravity of the situation hit you and when CentraCare realized, okay, now is time to respond. I think for us larger systems, uh, we uh, certainly took action uh, before it got public. Uh, the way that we manage crises in healthcare is to establish what's called an instant command structure. This is where we, uh, it's, it's much like a military approach. We find leaders and uh, then marshal resources from different parts of our organization, and their job solely is to focus on the instant or crisis at hand. So it was about the third week of January uh, and when Centricare uh, set up our instant command structure uh, to follow it closely and uh, understand what it meant for the state, um, our populations, our organization, and our community. So we actually started quite early. So it sounds like Centricare was really on top of things. I'm curious, can you tell me a little bit more about that command center setup and how you were responding as the situation developed? This notion of a uh, uh, an epidemic or pandemic, if you want to call it that, uh, in medical uh, circles um, is a commonplace conversation point. Uh, we have been threatened with it before, H1N1, SARS, MERS. We see one every season with the flu, of course. Uh, Ebola a number of years ago. And so it is a, a public health uh, hmm, worst case scenario. And so uh, we uh, keep an eye on it. And uh, when we saw it start to bubble up, uh, particularly this particular virus, which is a, called a novel virus, it's new to the human experience, um, we were, uh, had concerns about it. And that uh, the early indications was it was quite uh, easily spread and uh, had devastating effects on morbidity and mortality. And managing the disease was going to be a challenge because there was no known treatment or vaccine. And so those were the... Um, elements that caused us to create our instant command structure, which then marshaled um, a lot of different resources, whether it's um, how many beds we have available, how much can we expand, um, personal protective equipment, uh, drugs, a supply chain management, um, personnel and um, training and all sorts of those things. So representing Greater Minnesota, did that present some unique challenges for Centricare? We um, have a um, a history uh, within Centric Care of being very collaborative in our communities. Um, what I will say next is um, not um, a negative about a large metro area, but a large metro area can be complicated. There are multiple health systems, multiple hospitals, uh, whereas in our geography, we provide um, a good chunk, if not most, of the health care. Uh, in many communities, we're the only hospital, we're the only clinics. And uh, so we are quite embedded in our communities. And so our relationships with uh, uh, community leaders, uh, chambers of commerce, uh, business leaders, public health and government officials is quite remarkable. And so uh, we were able to draw on that richness of our collaboration uh, in times past to help us build a model for the future. Yes, collaboration, especially amongst Medical Alley companies, seems to have been critical during COVID-19. Were there any Medical Alley companies you had to collaborate with? Yeah, so um, the care delivery organizations, um, Minnesota is fortunate to have um, um, eight really fine healthcare delivery organizations. They range from Mayo to um, Fairview, U of M, Hennepin County, North Memorial, Health Partners, Essentia, Alina. Uh, and we, um, and they, many of them are, are participants in uh, Medical Alley Association. Um, additionally, of course, we have well-known international firms like uh, 3M and Medtronic and Boston Scientific and, and many others whose names um, I could mention. Uh, and so our ability to not only network in terms of how we take care of patients, that would be care delivery, but also we, how we find the right supplies for our workers. That kind of mostly falls into um, hardware, software, for example, testing, ventilators, as well as personal protective equipment. 
masks and gowns and gloves. And so I think, again, this illustrates the um, unique culture of Minnesota in which we are able to collaborate uh, quite quickly, quite straightforwardly. And uh, we all have each other's cell phone numbers so we can call each other up if we, if we run into a challenge. And I think that reflects as well on state government, a good deal of trust with state government. You mentioned you have a large rural clientele. What specific challenges arose because of that? There are um, segments of the population that have been uh, more harder hit. Um, and I'll just mention several of them, not all of them. So certainly are, are those people that live in, and work in congregate work environments. So what do I mean by that? Where workers are pretty densely uh, together. And you, know, you can translate that to meatpacking plants. So we have a number of very large meatpacking plants uh, in our geography. And as you know, once a virus gets a hold in that context, it is a real challenge. And so we worked actively with the uh, employers and companies that uh, do meat um, uh, processing to figure out how we could help support them uh, in taking care of their employees and managing the disease in their communities. Likewise, um, rural Minnesota uh, has a preponderance of aging. Uh, folks. So um, every small town has at least one nursing home. Uh, the aging are an at-risk population, uh, not only because they're aging, but they have coexisting disease, heart disease, lung disease, as well as they live in congregate settings. So uh, working with the nursing home population is really important. Um, oddly enough, uh, because of the rural nature, uh, many people in rural environments um, don't view themselves at risk because they're not as densely living as in a large metro area. Uh, to compare a rural Minnesota town with New York, of course, is illogical at some point. On the other hand, the virus um, uh, is agnostic to uh, where you live. It's a matter of how infected uh, you get and how we manage the disease. So there were some unique challenges uh, related. I mentioned one other thing. Uh, unfortunately, in rural Minnesota, uh, our socioeconomic status is probably lower and our overall health status is lower than comparable metropolitan uh, environments. And that's always kind of a surprise when I say that. Uh, but our population is aging. Uh, our population tends to have more high blood pressure and other chronic diseases. And um, many of our counties have a good chunk of their population below the federal poverty level. Additionally, we um, many times in our rural populations have um, diverse employees uh, who have moved there for work reasons. And again, the COVID virus has uh, adversely affected diverse populations as well. So moving forward, from your perspective, are there steps that you see could help address those unique challenges? I think that um, whenever you talk about uh, steps, there's kind of short-term, medium-term, and long-term. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been for the most part, focusing on short-term and medium-term because we had a virus in our communities. Uh, there are um, certainly uh, large-scale structural uh, concerns that are present not only in rural America, but throughout America. And I think you can see that borne out in the George Floyd um, issues that have been raised because certainly uh, minority populations have been much greater hurt uh, by the virus than white populations. And so I think this does all tie together in some notion of how we improve the health and uh, economic and social well-being of those diverse populations. When the virus started to impact CentraCare's operations, how did your roles change? And what was the greatest challenge you had to overcome? I think um, one of our challenges was to recognize that um, business as normal um, and as we knew it, uh, was going to change very quickly. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, we canceled elective procedures. That could be an endoscopy, a surgery, a clinic visit. And so our volume dropped by a half. Um, secondly, we implemented a lot of initiatives in our clinics and hospitals, no visitors, uh, masking, um, and all sorts of ways in which we have normally gone about our work of providing health care to our communities. Um, likewise, that means that we have folks who once had a very meaningful job, uh, now don't have a job, uh, or we want them to do something different. 
So the second aspect is workforce. Um, how do we uh, uh, reassure our workforce uh, who are facing the same economic stress that everybody else is? Maybe their spouse lost their job um, or uh, their spouse was furloughed. So how do we understand the needs of our workforce? And that was a very high priority for us. Thirdly, is we had to really ramp up our supply chain. Uh, remember that the supply chain uh, issues were critical around the world. Um, this is a, the first disaster like this that has been worldwide. Most other disasters have some kind of a containment vehicle around it. For example, there are other really um, catastrophic events, but they have a perhaps a geographic limiter on them. Wildfires in California, 35W bridge going down, uh, flooding in Louisiana. And so there's a some kind of a natural containment vessel. Certainly there's been Ebola in Africa and, and other uh, outbreaks of, of viruses around the world. Uh, but this one hit the world pretty quick, pretty hard. And so the whole supply chain was disrupted. And then how do we make sure that we find supplies when the worldwide demand is escalating and there was trade tensions before that. Uh, so to manage this uh, significant challenge of finding enough stuff to take care of our patients and our employees. So those would be the, the major ways, I think. And I think I should mention one other thing. And you can still feel it today. Uh, there is a heaviness in, in, in the souls of people. Uh, the human being is by nature a social um, animal. In times of stress, whether it's a funeral, a loss, a marriage, a uh, graduation. We tend to want to be with people that we care about and love. Mm -hmm. And this has disrupted our coping mechanism and the way in which we get support and encouragement and even energy from our folks around us. So I think that has been uh, an issue that is not widely talked about, but I think it's quite profound. I absolutely agree. How has Centricare been addressing these issues? So I think that... Um, uh, we have a fairly large mental health platform uh, for our communities. So certainly we have seen um, um, uh, a demand in depression. Uh, and so we continue to provide that care. But uh, most importantly, how do we provide uh, resources to our employees uh, through our employee health services related to how they're feeling and how they're doing, whether it's themselves or their spouse or their family members. Uh, remember that our employees have a relative that may be sick, or mom that's in the hospital and they can't go view them. Uh, they might have had kids who are not going to school and all of a sudden they're at home. And so the impacts on our workforce were quite significant. Uh, and the third thing was uh, how do we work with our businesses to help them understand the demand. So um, in all of our communities, as I mentioned earlier, Centric Care is a, uh, we are the largest employer outside the metro. And in all of our communities, we're either the largest or second largest employer. And so how do we work with other uh, businesses and communities, whether it's the Chamber of Commerce, uh, elected government officials to understand the impact of the virus um, in our communities from uh, not even a healthcare perspective, but a broader community perspective. And that has involved a lot of outreach, uh, whether it's outreach with um, um, printed material, to uh, forums on the radio and TV, to printed materials, uh, working with educational sessions with the chamber, um, finding um, uh, language competent interpreters uh, to work with our diverse employees uh, and uh, community members. And so it's been really quite broad ranging. And this has all been under the, the work of the incident command structure. So you're a leader of Centricare, and you're also a medical alley leader. You serve on the Medical Alley Association Board of Directors. And in that role, you have a deep insight into the medical alley community's response to the pandemic. Can you talk to me a little bit about your leadership role in medical alley and what you've observed? There are certainly um, in American business, a, a number of member driven organizations. And that is certainly uh, true of uh, the Medical Alley Association. I think that um, functional member-driven organizations are one in which there's a personal relationship amongst the membership and the sense of, in, in a broad perspective, common destiny. Even though a company might do this or that, or might even compete, there is a, a sense of common shared uh, views of how we do our work, a common shared perspective of our employees, 
um, and of our customers and of our community. And I think that's true in spades uh, for the Medical Alley Association. Uh, there's a network of trust uh, amongst the uh, members and the leaders. So that's one thing. I think the overall culture of the Medical Alley Association is one that, that promotes uh, goodwill and good work. I think the second thing is, is that the Medical Alley Association has fostered the innovation and um, how do we, uh, in crises, think differently? Uh, and so you saw that in a number of the companies, the Medical Alley Association, who uh, redid uh, product lines to come up to make um, additional material and equipment for us. And so innovation, uh, I think, is another hallmark of our Medical Alley Association. And the third is um, we understand the importance of our workforce uh, to achieving our goals. Minnesota companies are, are fairly, um, I'll use the word enlightened, but it's not a very good word, related to how we understand um, the importance of our employees. And so we share this common concern that as leaders, um, how do we engage our employees in the meaningful work that each of our member organizations does? Uh, so I think those would be the three major attributes at a very high level. And you touched on this a little bit earlier, but lastly, I wanted to ask you, how has the coronavirus changed healthcare moving forward? Has it been irrevocably changed? I'll answer that in two threads. Uh, prior to the coronavirus, um, there was a, um, a large energy around uh, changes in healthcare. Um, many of them related to um, several primary conversation points. Certainly one is cost. Um, a good chunk of Americans get their cost, uh, the cost of healthcare paid for by the government through Medicare, Medi Medicaid, and other government programs. And so uh, with the federal budget uh, being challenged, certainly there had been enormous cost pressures um, on uh, healthcare organizations. And the uh, slope of the curve of the spend in healthcare does not, has not been going down the way people would like it to. And so uh, prior to COVID, there was a lot of energy around the cost structure of healthcare. Likewise, there has been enormous technological transformation. You and I are witnessing it today. And so uh, healthcare was in the, in the early stages of a technological revolution in how we provide care. And um, there were uh, many reasons why uh, we were reluctant to do that from either a uh, business perspective or an individual person, for example, a physician being hesitant to or even a patient reluctant to engage in a virtual or technology-enabled care process. And, uh, and the COVID virus really accelerated that change uh, in a remarkable way. So in a period of, a, of a, a month or two months or three months, we've had to significantly, uh, I will use the word transform, transform our business models. Uh, to where we're seeing thousands of patients a week um, on technology-enabled platforms. Um, much of the work that we do that used to be uh, in in-person meetings are now done virtually. Um, and so uh, the COVID virus has really um, provided the impetus and removed the barriers. We had to change. Uh, and so I think that uh, that's going to be with us forever. There was a second part of your question, and that is how COVID has changed uh, changed it forever. And I would mention it um, in the context of not only technology is here for say to stay, and there is a, a huge investment going on by all sorts of venture capital firms and and legacy companies like Amazon and Apple and healthcare. Uh, but we also need to learn to live with this virus until there's an effective vaccine or a some notion of herd immunity, which means that for the next time period, let's say 10, 12, 14 months, whatever that might be, uh, the virus will be in our midst. And, and what does that mean for us as businesses, as consumers, as uh, patients, as moviegoers, as people that shop at a store, go to a restaurant? So how do we understand living with the virus? Um, how do healthcare organizations have enough capacity to manage episodic surges or rolling surges or hotspots of virus um, density in a population. 
And um, I suspect that the new normal that everybody wants to get back to is going to be slower and it will be different. I don't think the new normal is the same as it was five months ago. And I think that we're not going to um, leap back to the way things were five months ago <clears throat> um, in an equivalent time frame. So I think it's going to be slower and perhaps significantly different. And that is the notion of leadership. Uh, leaders don't necessarily know uh, where the ball is going to end up, but we provide a vehicle for us to create a vision for a different future. And I think, again, that's what Medical Alley um, has. That was our interview with Ken Holman, President and CEO of CentraCare. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Medical Alley Association Series Leadership Through a Crisis. To make sure you don't miss a single episode, be sure to visit us at medicalalley.org, sign up for our newsletter, and follow us on social media.